What's up? It's episode 54, Pain Points of Wealth, and the Fed finally admitted it. Inflation is not as transitory as initially was thought. As we've been telling you on this podcast week after week, interest rates moved 20% last week as we're starting to see the bond market move in the wrong direction. As interest rates are going up, inflation's kicking in, supply chains around America are a mess right now. You can't hire enough truckers. You can't hire enough people to work at the ports. We're literally seeing a domino effect and huge delays on all products and services as they move slowly across the country. What does this mean for you? What does this mean for your portfolio? We're going to give you our view of exactly what's happening in the economy right now, what you need to be doing strategically. Money's moving out of tech stocks, moving into those old school cyclical stocks that you know Bob, Chris, and I love. In addition to that, on the tipping point today, we're going to talk about your financial advisor. Are they really, really nice? but they don't give you good advice. We're going to tell you exactly how to handle that. We got a great show. Hit the music. Hey, Rod, you asked that question, what does it mean to you? Well, let me tell you what it means to me, the supply chain being so screwed up right now. I got a box delivered this past Monday. I open it up, and it's half a stool. Now, it took me a while to figure it out because it just, you know, it's a weird-looking thing. And so I called a company, and I said, well, I ordered six stools, but uh, all I got was a half. And I said, no, that's weird. You're supposed to get the whole stool in the box. Um, we'll look into it. And uh, I said, well, you know, when are you going to deliver these? Well, maybe in a month or two. And I said, well, in a month or two, I'll be in Florida. Oh, well, when you'll be back, pick the day you'll be back and we'll get it to you that day. So I said, oh, I got a better idea. You know, if you can't get it here within a specific month, I don't think you can get it here a specific day. Let's just call it quits. I'm going to start all over again when I come back from Florida in, in May. And that's the reality of it. I mean, the Wall Street Journal had a great article this week just talking about how you, you literally can't find enough workers even if you had the ports open 24-7, there's not enough people to man the ports as you have ships like sitting for weeks waiting to unload their cargo. And then you're waiting for, you know, one part of the supply chain gets messed up. Maybe a truck doesn't show up for a shipment on time and it just affects everything. And it's just wreaking havoc on the entire economy right now. Well, it's not just here, guys. I actually have a client of mine that owns a retail running shoe store. And he told me that most of the shoes are produced in Vietnam and a lot of those factories are getting shut down. He's actually having to buy every possible shoe on the market right now just so he has inventory for the next 18 months. Well, that's a story. I mean, you have semiconductors are all backlogged, you know, steel, lumber, housing's going up like crazy. People are building everywhere. I don't know what they're going to fill it up with. I mean, you know, beach chairs and and uh and sleeping bags because you can't get any furniture. You can't get any any um three, two. You can't get appliances. But you know what? I mean, the market doesn't really seem to care because here's the thing about the market. The market looks forward. All this is priced in already. Now, we are getting a little bit of corrective action, but that's primarily because what you said, Rye, that the Fed didn't say transitory last week, which means they're starting to believe their own lying eyes like we've been telling you to believe that inflation's going up. So interest rates are going up. And I hope all of you listened. Those bond funds are dropping like rocks. And you have to get into fixed income, not bond funds. Yeah. And again, this is going to be a persistent problem, right? Because the whole idea was these supply chains, there's this big, you know, huge spurt of demand initially, but that's going to start to wane and all these supply chains are going to get back in line. That's probably not going to happen because you don't have enough workers. You know, that's one of the things we've talked about week after week on this show is we've got a labor shortage. We don't have enough people that could actually even man the supply chains to make sure that goods and services get essentially done on time. And this is going to just persist for a long time. And the one thing you're seeing is it was like 44% of conference calls or earnings calls this last quarter. Every company was talking about one thing, uh, inflation, inflationary pressure. And as we know, guys, we know who's going to end up paying that, that uh, higher costs at the end of the day. Well, it's not just inflation of products. It's also wage inflation. You know, one of the things that happened during this pandemic a lot of people my age retired. Hey, that's a great idea. You know what? I think I'm going to retire. What do you think, guys? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, I'm coming with you, Bob. Well, you know what, guys? Speaking of 
having trouble getting employees. I was talking to a client of mine who's a dentist up in North Jersey and um, his, uh, his primary assistant um, left retired earlier in May and they haven't even been able to get somebody. And then he told me about a friend of his uh, who's a dentist and he's answering his own phones. So you think about this, like, you know how busy it is when you go into the dentist office. Could you imagine the guy that's working your teeth is not only working on your teeth, but also answering the phones? It's literally every business right now. Um, you know, I talked to an estate planner we work with and she said, well, I'm just not going to take new work in the next couple of months because we have too much to work on now. So it's literally like they're cutting off uh, bringing new business. Like, imagine that. Well, things will evolve. You know, things will become more automated. The jobs will change. Um, so some of these skills that workers who do want to come back to work may not apply right now. So there's going to have to be a little bit of re-education. But, you know, all this will work out because the market, again, incorporates that all into the current pricing, right? We're getting a little price adjustment right now because rates have gone a little bit higher. Um, so you're getting a price adjustment in stocks. You're getting a bigger price adjustment in bonds. Um, and you just got to be careful that you have a well-diversified portfolio, one that doesn't include bond funds. If you didn't get the message, Bob does not like bond funds. Well, it's a good point because earlier this year, when we did see the treasury yield spike up to 1.7%, and as we're recording this, we're around like 1.5% today, is tech stocks got whacked, right? And because it's kind of the anti-inflationary trade. When you start looking at tech stocks, they trade on profits way out into the future, well, when you have inflation, no one cares way about cares about way out in the future. You care about immediate profits now, and that's where you know the name cyclical stocks comes from. Is those stocks go with the cycle of the economy? And right now, the cycle of the economy is the economy's heating up, so those cyclical stocks are going to heat up as well. It's kind of a simple concept, but it's an important one, and that's why you need to position your portfolio with those quote unquote cyclical stocks. So, Chris. Here's the Dean of Common Sense again, giving investment advice. The price of oil is going up, so buy oil stocks. Interest rates are going up, so buy banks. Wow. You know where I, you always write about these things. It's such common sense. You know, it's like it's in plain sight. What have been the best performers over the last couple of weeks? Oil stocks, bank stocks, industrial stocks, what we call cyclical stocks. So you just have to make sure you're in those stocks before they go up. You know what I always say? You make more money, you create more wealth owning the most amount of shares of something before it goes up. That's why we buy low here. It's, you know, the Dean of Common Sense, Mr. Ryan Payne. You know, guys, what's it like being around my brilliance all the time? It must get, a, <laughs> must get annoying. I'm sorry. I'll try Gives to, me I'll a try headache, to Chris. I don't know me. about you. <laughs> I'm not sure what's more annoying, your, uh, your, your, your ability to be right all the time or your massive ego. <laughs> <laughs> and how about commodities this year? My goodness, you know, I mean, we remember, we look at, what, 40, 50 portfolios a month, there's a couple of things that these portfolios never have. They never have commodities. They never have small cap value stocks, right? They never have international stocks. It's amazing how many investors out there don't have a portfolio with the key elements of success. Yeah. And again, it, we talk about this a lot, but you know, we're, the dynamics are shifting here, right? I mean, we know we talked about inflation for a long time. We said, don't listen to the Fed. It's not transitory. And now the Fed's saying, you know what? Guess what? We were wrong. It's not transitory. Um, and I think that's, that's indicative of what's going to be here. This phenomenon of inflation, which we didn't have the last decades here for a while. So it's a different type of portfolio that works in that environment. So it's, again, kind of a simple concept, but it's an important one. But I think the other thing to think about here, too, is everybody's waiting for that dip this fall, right? Everyone's waiting for that other shoe to drop. You know, there's a lot of issues with this Delta variant rising. There's a lot of issues, again, with supply chains. And economic growth is going to slow down a little bit, but still it is improving. But as we're seeing here, because there's so much money out there, is you're not getting any dips. So I think the other mistake you're going to make here is sitting in cash is not the place to be. You've got to get invested. And you can't wait for this big dip because so far it's not happening. We did tell you that too. Well, we are getting a little dip this week, right? And I, I'll tell you, Chris, I'm excited because all of our portfolio holdings went ex-dividend. We're going to have a bunch of cash to put to work on Thursday. And I just hope this market stays down long enough to give me really good prices for my clients. Well, you know what, guys? I can't imagine why anybody would want to sit in cash. I mean, you know, you're getting less than 1% in your money market. But if you think about it, you know, not only do markets go up over time, but everything we own in our portfolio pays a dividend. Right. So it's getting basically, I always say the market bribes you to wait just because those dividends come in every single quarter, no matter what. 
you know, even back in 2008, back in March during the height of the pandemic, we were still getting that cash flow. So you can sit on the sidelines and wait, but chances are the market's going to pass you by. Well, Chris, I've been keeping money in cash for my bar stools. I guess that was a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, I've, been, I've, I've got some I, sound advice for you. Why don't you give it to I, your grandchild? I, I, I seriously, seriously doubt, Bob, that you had any money just sitting in cash. <laughs> um, but no, I think that's the bottom line here, right? When you think about the economy right now, you think about investing, it's really just simple. There's trillions of dollars the government's created. It's all out there. Either that money's going to get spent in the economy. And we know Bob's going to help that out in a big way. Or you need to get a return on your money. You can't just sit in cash when you have inflation because there's nothing. So that money's going to funnel its way into the stock market because you are getting a return there. So, you know, to keep this simple here, guys, look, inflation's real. It's kicking in. The Fed has been telling you a lie. So you've got to be smart here. You've got to diversify. And when I mean diversify, you've got to have those inflation hedges in your portfolio because inflation is real. You don't want to sit in cash. That's like the anti-inflationary trade. And you don't want to have all your money in tech. You heard it here first. Get that money to work. Get it diversified. Be prepared. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 54, Pain Points of Wealth. We thank you for the support. We literally have doubled our listenership. It keeps growing month after month. So please don't keep us a secret. Click that like button. Give us a five-star rating on iTunes. Leave some comments. And if you're watching this on YouTube right now, click that subscribe button. You can click that notification key. So every single week, you'll be notified of our new episodes. Thanks again for the support. Like, love our content. Keep supporting us so we can keep creating all this content just for you. Okay, Chris and Bob, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point, having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And Chris and Bob, you know, we manage to look at like 50 portfolios a month at our firm, Pain Capital Management. We probably see more strategies than any other firm on Wall Street. We know exactly what different advisors are offering, what their services are. But we find a lot of times when you come into our offices is you might have a really nice advisor or broker at whatever firm you're working with, but they're not exactly doing a very stellar job. So I think we talk about some of the ridiculousness of some of the statements we might say or to justify or rationalize the fact that we do have a nice advisor, but they're not really giving us really good advice. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've seen that. It's, you know, just because they worked with somebody, it's easier not to move to someone else who may be better because most of you have had bad experiences. You know, it's almost like you're afraid to go from the pot to the fire because uh, last time I switched, oh, that person made all kinds of promises and they were worse than the person I left. So I can understand you know, the reticence to move your portfolio or your planning to someone else. Proof's in the pudding. I think you've got to see the action, not the words. Yeah. And one of the, the comments I hear often is we never get together for reviews. I really get my phone calls returned, but I know he is really busy and he worked with my dad for years. So I assume he's taking care of me. He's probably not, <laughs> you know? Well, you know what they say about assumptions. You should never assume that they're working for you. Well, I get a good question from a prospective client who called and asked me about our services. And they said, well, you know, someone told me it's really important that your advisor is local. And I said, you know, not necessarily. I know lots of different people that have had advisors locally and they never heard from their advisor. You know, whereas now we have clients all across the country. We do Zoom calls. We check in on a monthly, quarterly basis. So I would be more concerned about the service model. And if you're not getting proactive service, whether it's a phone call, Zoom call, or even if they're around the corner, it doesn't really matter. It's all about that proactive service because it is a service, right? And if you're not getting service, you're paying for a lot of actions that you're not getting. Well, my favorite is when you sit down with someone and they do have a primary advisor, but that primary advisor doesn't do a full review, You know, doesn't have a 360 financial portal like we do. So they don't have a full picture. They basically take this segment of your portfolio that you've allowed them to manage and they manage it in a vacuum. They don't know that you have an additional $5 million custody to 10 different places. And so when we sit down and we put it all together, most of these newer clients are shocked to find out that they're 25% in cash. They have 50% of their portfolio in the same asset class, that they own bond funds. I mean, it's, it's amazing that I don't know if the client's reticent to let somebody know where everything is, 
or there's just a lot of lazy advisors out there who don't want to do the work. You know, it's really irresponsible. It's like going to the doctor and the doctor just gives you a prescription without doing a full exam and finding out what the root causes are. Well, there's an important concept, right? You want your money all working in concert. But the problem is most advisors or quote unquote brokers, they're mostly brokers, are in the business of selling you products, right? Putting your money into something we hope is good. I always hear that. I, I hope it's pretty good, the, the investment he, he, he or she put me in. Um, which is a horrible way to invest, right? Because it's more about like, I'm buying this and essentially it's part of an overall strategic strategy. And you're right, that's, what, that's the problem when you have like 10 different advisors, you get like 10 cooks in the kitchen and you never get that concerted effort. And that's like the, the hallmark of really good financial planning is to have a concerted effort with all your money. Well, it's like a lot of time we get these questions, like I don't, you know, from, from prospective clients, I don't really understand what's in my portfolio. And when I ask my advisor about it, he explains it to you or she explains it to me. I just don't really get it. Well, you need to know what you own. You need to know why you own it because there's a lot of advisors that I have worked against, I guess, is the way to look at it, right? Because I've taken their accounts away from them where these people are prejudiced. They're prejudiced against equities. They're prejudiced against fixed income. You know, one of my nearest, dearest clients, who's become a great friend, lost a million dollars back in the 2000 market decline because his stockbroker didn't like bonds. This guy was 70 years old. He didn't have a dollar in bonds. I said, why don't you have your money in safe bonds? My broker doesn't like them. I mean, what does what you like have to do with helping people achieve their goals? Yeah, and it's terrible. And again, it's like, you know, we, we try to use all this fancy language. Chris Bob told me he uses the fanciest language he can to keep people in the dark so he can keep his job. I said, that's how he's gone for over 45 years. No, 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 right. Secret. That was that was when I wa- <laughs> that was when I wanted to be a lawyer. <laughs> But of our industry is just so guilty of this, right? We love that. I mean, it's just like nothing is worse than sitting across from a client and just seeing their eyes glaze over because you know you're talking over their head with all the financial jargon. It's like the worst thing you can do. And I think the hallmark of a good advisor, I'm using that word hallmark a lot today, is when someone can break things down into a simple way for you to understand it. Because everything we're doing here is not rocket science, right? I mean, if it feels like rocket science, you got a problem. It should be common sense. And I think we just, you know, our industry is terrible at this. They make it seem like everything's behind the curtain here. You know, leave it to us. We'll do everything. Don't think. And that's like, that's not where you want to be with the relationship with your advisor. You need to understand. You need someone can articulate what they do to you in a simple manner. Chris, it sounds like to me, Ryan's saying, if you have something like crypto in your portfolio, private equity, hedge fund, uh, long, short, absolute value fund, um, somebody's talking about the you know, capture of the portfolio, the low vol, high vol, you might have the wrong person. Well, you know, there you go, dad, using all those complex terms. But uh, going back to going back to Ryan's point, you know, not only should you be able to understand what's in your portfolio, you should also understand how it relates to you and the goals that you're trying to trying to achieve. If you don't know what you own and you don't know why you own it, you won't stay invested. I mean, I spent my first 10 years, you know, rebuilding my my clientele because they thought, hey, Bob, you're investing money for to make money. As soon as it went down, they'd say goodbye. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't attach their emotional resolve to a portfolio. It has to be re- attached to your goals, to a purpose, to a meaning. Yeah, exactly. Your goals and understanding. And I think this is, again, this is why crypto to me is a big red flag. It's just because when people explain it to me, I literally think they're talking about something that's out of sci-fi. <laughs> you know, there's words like DeFi. And, you know, you have this, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's tethered and you're like, what the heck are they talking about? And, and I, it's scary because you hear people that are way into cryptocurrencies and they're into SPACs and they don't really understand how it actually works. And you kind of realize they don't understand it and they just make it sound so complicated. So it sounds like they know what they're talking about, but they probably really don't. You know, one of our favorite clients uh, texted me this week and he congratulated me on the birth of my grandson. And the market happened to be down six, 700 points that day. He said, can you believe it? Bob's grandson's born and the market drops like a rock. And I reminded our good friend, the colonel, that, hey, this allows me to buy low in my grandson's 529 plan because we're investing based on a goal. Then there's no emotion. Makes it simple. The best time to buy is when the opportunity presents itself. The last complaint I hear is, I know the market's been up big the last couple of years, but my portfolio doesn't seem to have done that well. But my advisor is a really nice person, and I haven't wanted to make a change. Hey, Chris, you know, we're working with that trust account right now. The advisor was a financial magician. 
He took a great 10-year market. I mean, one of the best 10-year bull markets I've ever been in, and he managed to lose money for this trust. <laughs> if that's not a magician, I don't know what is. <laughs> that's totally a red flag. And you know what we find a lot of times is when we go and review these portfolios where, okay, the market did great, but maybe you didn't do anything, it's because typically the fees are exorbitant. Like a lot of these annuities, I hate to pick on annuities, but sometimes the fees are 4 or 5%. You know, if you're taking four or five percent to the insurance company every year, how in the world are you ever going to get a good return on your money? So that's a total red flag. I don't care how nice that insurance person is, broker, advisor, but you've got to get a second opinion and just start to deep dive into that portfolio because just because they're nice doesn't mean they're not robbing you. That's such a great point. I had a client call the other day and he said, Bob, what's my portfolio up, right? When I'm with our software, we can tell you where you are year to date since inception, you know, last month, last week, right? It takes what, 30 seconds, 10 seconds. We called his insurance guy and he's had an investment in this insurance plan for 20 years. Doesn't know the return. We're still waiting six months. He can't tell us what the rate of return is. Maybe he doesn't want to tell us. Dad, relax. It's, it's complicated. <laughs> That's right. Nothing to see here. Look the other way. And that's, cr that's the crazy part, too, is you know, we're trying to get some information on this one annuity. And the insurance company says, oh, no, no, we can't give that information out uh, on you know, hypothetically how this annuity would have done or you know, what the payout would be. It's, it can only be done once a year and you have to request it ahead of time. And they make it so convoluted, so hard to get any information that you just give up. <laughs> You're like, I give up. I, I don't even know. I'll just keep this, this product. And I, I mean, there's a lot of that designed to keep you in the dark where you just don't want to look at your investments and figure out what's going on. You know, guys, I'll sum up the tipping point this week. You know, when you were growing up, I said, never go to a deli where you buy mystery meat. Don't go with an advisor where you get mystery investments. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 54, Pain Points of Wealth. Bob, Chris, and I now have a collective 75 years helping individuals just like you if they're planning and investing. I mean, we literally been do this every single day. This is all we think about. And everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially at any stage of your journey. But if you have over $750,000 saved for retirement and you want a more hands-on approach and you want to get a full review of your portfolio, you can apply for a complimentary financial review by Bob, Chris, myself. Go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a full holistic financial review, we do a deep dive of everything. We'll go through every investment you own. We'll look at your diversification. We'll look at what fees you're paying. We'll show you where those hidden costs are. We can reduce those fees on your portfolio. We'll take you through a full savings and income plan to make sure that you're on track with what you should be saving for your financial independence. We'll look at essentially, we're going we're to look at putting together a full income plan for you so you know exactly what you can draw from your portfolio later. We're going to look at tax optimization so you're not paying more in taxes than you should be. There's no other firm in the country that does this type of review and does this work up front. So see if you qualify for a free financial review. Simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan. That's www.paincm.com paincm.com slash financial plan. Hey, hope you're enjoying this episode. 54 pain points of wealth. Show us some love. Give us a like. Subscribe to our channel. We've doubled our listenership. We really appreciate the support so we can keep doing this. If you're on iTunes, give us that five-star rating. Leave a comment. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you can subscribe. Click that little notification bell. So every week you can be updated of all our new episodes literally coming out weekly. All right, gentlemen. It's the hidden facts of finance. Random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. So Bob, on September 30th, 1981, amid high inflation and a crippling recession, the 10-year treasury note yielded 15.82%. It's a far cry from the 1.5% we have today. I mean, think about it, guys. You had a return, a yield, on a government-guaranteed investment that was 50% above the historical return in the stock market with virtually no risk at all. Now, here's the lesson that's learned from that. Always invest in the market you have, not the market you want. I had a prospective client back back at 81. He owned a big roofing company. And for his pension fund, I said, let's put a ton of money into the 10-year treasury. He said, no, Bob, it's only 15.82. I want 16. And he sat in cash for the whole period. He sat in cash and while rates went all the way from 15.82 
down to one. Never invest it. Unbelievable, man. I would love to get a guaranteed 15% a year. That's pretty sweet. All right, Chris. IRA plus 401k balances built by US savers by generation. Baby boomers have logged in an average of 462,000 in retirement accounts. Millennials have an average of 66,000. And Generation X has an average of 247. We're catching up on those baby boomers. Well, guys, it's no secret that the baby boomers are the wealthiest generation. But what really concerns me here is how dismal the millennials' savings amounts are. You know, it just goes to show you as a millennial myself, you really need to start getting serious about your financial planning and start to build up those 401ks, IRAs, and brokerage accounts. That's good you said that, Chris, because Bob and I have been waiting for you to get serious for a very long time. I just need a good financial advisor. <laughs> He's not just going to sell you products, <laughs> high feed annuities. Bob, easy money has helped to swell the balance sheet of U.S. households whose net worth has soared to a record $141 trillion as of June 30th. We're getting rich. I'll tell you what, I love it, Rye. I love the fact that we're the wealthiest as a country as we've ever been in history. Uh, pretty soon, I'll be heading down to Florida, playing with some of the retirees and visiting with some of our clients down there. And I can't wait for them to tell me, well, that's really good, Bob. But how's that possible when things are so bad? It always drives me crazy. People don't understand. Things are good. It's the best they've ever been. And it's not just the stock market. Real estate prices are going through the roof. And Chris, millennials, well, they're going to be in good shape because starting this year, $2 trillion a year is going to transition through the estates of the wealthy baby boomers who are passing down to the next generation. $70 trillion is moving downstream over the next 10 years. Guess what, guys? That's going to find its way into financial assets. Well, Bob, Chris, and I would like to talk about your wealth transference plan after this episode. I have Chris. a grandson. You guys are out. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. Foregoing conclusion. <laughs> so, Chris, there's 13 U.S. corporate tax hikes on record going back to 1925. In the ensuing 12 months, the S&P rose nine times, averaging... 11.1%. On the personal income side, Congress has hiked the top bracket 14 times. The S&P rose in the next 12 months after 10 of them averaging a whopping 16.8%. Sounds like raising taxes is actually good for the market. Who would not Who would have thought? Well, boys, I'll tell you what, one of the biggest fears that my clients have right now is that a tax hike is going to have a negative impact on the market. But it sounds like based on these statistics, that's probably not going to be the reality. I think the bottom line is a bull market is going to be a bull market regardless of short-term moves and taxes. And as we've said here first, we know money's got to go somewhere. Better be bullish than foolish, as Bob likes to say. All right, another great episode. Thank you again for your support. If you like our content, love our content, please click on that like button, subscribe. Uh, forward this to a friend, anyone can benefit from our ever ongoing quest to give you the best financial information. Have a great week. As always, stay loose and keep an open mind.